Hey folks, last time I addressed the fish that is depicted on some of the Cycladic so-called frying pans. If you watched all episodes, um, then you will understand why these items deserve a closer look. Well, I am not done with that yet. We haven't seen much of the swastika lately, but this time it will reappear. At least it appears within reach. Although this is sort of a small sub-series, if you want. The fish symbol, first of all, reminded me of a compass, a compass in the shape of a fish. If it doesn't ring a bell yet, then a, a simple search on the, on the history of the compass will tell you that the Chinese were the first to use one, documented not earlier than the end of the 5th millennium BC. Uh, century, 5th century BC. It would take another 1300 years or so before um, they would use this compass to actually navigate ships on the Indian Ocean and the Pacific to eventually be brought to Europe around 1200 AD. If you insist on believing that, you can stop right now and go watch something more to your bidding Obviously, I cannot accept this as a fact. Leaving aside for now whether the Cycladic boatsmen knew how uh, knew of such magic or not, they knew how to rely on the stars and were able to read the waves and wind despite lack of compass. Having a magnetic compass of some sort was certainly no necessity to achieve what they did. When I discovered the occurrence of a Chinese fish-shaped com uh, compass, I started doing some reading, thinking I must do something with this, kind of waiting for a convenient moment to bring it up in a video. Now I think I found that perfect opportunity. A compass basically shows you both the north and south. There are dry compasses by which a magnetized needle is suspended so it can move freely and there are wet compasses. The most primitive form being a wooden floater capable of bearing the weight of a lodestone. During the 1600s a navigation tool was invented by which the needle was replaced by a wind disc suspended in liquid to maintain its position. I think the first question is what exactly is a lodestone? Most dictionaries will tell us that lodestone is naturally magnetized mineral, mostly magnetite. Wiki has a relatively good but short piece on lodestone and what makes them so special. But it requires more to get at least a broader perspective and maybe a slightly more accurate timeline than most sources will offer. Just like iron, magnetite, a kind of ferro-oxide, will be attracted to a lodestone or a magnet. But isn't, it is not really magnetic, magnetic on itself, and yes, it makes up the larger part of a lodestone, together with a few other residues of different minerals. To harvest the iron out of the raw magnetite ore, it is grinded and a magnet will be used to attract iron out of it. It is a very simple process. Magnetite crystals are present in many kinds of stone and during the formation of igneous, metamorphic and sedimentary rocks, the crystals will align themselves to the magnetic field lines of the earth. Uh, observing this alignment in stones allows our geologists to get a better understanding of magnetic and geological changes that occurred in the past and drive, derive from that um, properties like tectonic movement, etc. Paleomagnetism yields valuable data for various disciplines of study. Lodestone will not be mined deep under the earth though, like magnetite. It will almost always be found in, on the surface or at shallow depth. The reason for that also explains its natural magnetization. Lodestone is, like I already said, ferromagnetic or 
mostly containing magnetite, which was zapped by lightning bolts. Short little article on that, with more connections to investigate for those interested. Links will be in the notes under the video. This makes one wonder if the ancients would have made this link and called it a thunderstone or maybe this name was reserved solely for uh, meteors. Some meteors do contain magnetoids. An, an interesting object was recently found on Antarctica. The meteor is claimed to be of Martian origin and contains the mineral greygite. Greygite is a magnetite produced by magnetotactic uh, bacteria together with sulfate reducing bacteria. These bacteria, the, the magnetotactic ones I mean, uh, contain one or more magnetite crystals, forcing them to align with Earth's magnetic field. In other words, they are prisoners of the white lines of the global magnetic freeway. This rare grey guide is a load of those bacteria fossilized. For some researchers, reason enough to conclude that there is or at least was life on Mars. These magnetotactic bacteria can be found on Earth around vents on the seafloor. In the Indian Ocean, a unique creature can be found called the scaly foot snail or sea pangolin. It also thrives around these hydrothermal vents and its shell as well as its body contains ferrosulfides and symbiotic bacteria, which raises questions about the crucial role of cooperations of bacteria creating life forms in general. In any, in any case, the military is very interested in this feature. It is such particles of magnetite found in magnetotactic bacteria that are now discovered within the brain of all kinds of animals, also humans, and are said to be responsible for the ability of orientation during yearly migration. The invention of the compass, like I said, is ascribed to the Chinese of 600 BC as is documented in 1400-year-old memoirs of uh, Zhu Majian. It was used by the military to orientate when the enemy used smoke curtains and such. Most sources tell us they did not use it to navigate the waters before the 11th century AD. <clears throat> Now, this Chinese compass was made of lodestone floating on a wooden fish in a bowl of liquid oil or water. The lodestone being suspended and free to align itself would point the way and the Chinese called it the self-pointing uh, compass, which is quite evident since their trade interests lay uh, southwards, not so much northwards. Some claim that the compass was based on an item that comes out of Feng Shui practice. This item contains a bronze plate with a symbolic representation of the sky. Chan diagrams, like they are called, like this, show a heaven divided in four parts. Four auspicious celestial symbols guard the four these four capital directions. The Azure Dragon of the East, the Vermilion Bird of the South, the White Tiger of the West and the Black Tortoise of the North are the Guardian Beasts. The diagram relates to sky worship and is said to have been introduced by the Zhu dynasty during 2nd millennium BC. The, the Zhu apparently originated from the Central Asian regions northeast of the Taklamakan Desert and practiced shamanism. Check out episodes 8 and 9 for a bit more basic info on the swastika in that region. I have more to present soon on that, by the way. Chan is sky and Chan Su stands for the pivot of the sky. Chan refers to the northern celestial pole, the nail around which the sky turns. 
the relation to the swastika should be obvious to most. A soup spoon made of lodestone completes the sky diagram and symbolizes the Ursa major constellation, turning around the celestial pole. At a, st at a certain point in time, the emperor was often depicted as a deity among the stars, his chariot replacing the seven peaceful ones or seven sages that make up the constellation. Ursa Major, a.k.a. the Plow, a.k.a. the Big Dipper, a.k.a. the Chariot, is one of the most credible explanations for the origins and wide dispersal of the swastika. Symbolizing the progress of time, the inevitability of the wheel of fate going round and round, and there are variations using Ursa Minor instead, which circles uh, much closer to Polaris. Although there is good reason to believe that may be not entirely true. When Qian means heaven for the Chinese, Long means dragon. Chan Long is either the star Zeta Draco, the star closest to the ecliptic pole, or the entire Draco's uh, constellation. Draco curls around the ecliptic pole, which could favor favorably be considered the real center of the night, since even Polaris turns around it. The Chinese call it the heavenly throne of the celestial dragon. I'm coming back to this lizard in uh, probably the next episode. The bronze board and lodestone spoon were very early on used in Feng Shui architecture. It was used for example to, to determine different features of a building according to the capital directions. Experiments have shown that this alignment is not always that accurate. Uh, what is more, among several of such items found in rich tombs, only a small minority of these spoons are actually made of a real lodestone. I found references to the shape of the wooden tool in which the magnetized needle was placed to float, but some refer to the shape of the box in which a bowl was kept, rather than the floater itself. Although mostly shaped like a fish, some had the shape of a turtle. The turtle or tortoise had a very special place among the mythical creatures who act in some of the indigenous cre creation myths from the Americas as well as Asia. Turtle is the one who carries first creation on his back and supports the heaven's dome. To the Chinese and more in particular modern Feng Shui practitioners, it stands for wisdom and endurance and longevity, of course. I mentioned the Americas and this brings us to another subject that is summarized at Wikipedia on the history of the compass page. It takes place around the same time, um, that is the time when the Olmec occupied and influenced Central America during the late, the late second and first millennium BC. They are believed by many to have brought the first script to the Americas and they developed a calendar that formed the base of the Maya calendar. This mysterious civilization that so easily speaks to our imagination still fascinates many, enough to spend a lot of suggestions on their origins. In the Reflection on Skygazing episode 13b I spoke of the craftsmanship of the early Mesoamericans in making their mirrors. Archaeological uh, discoveries from the last 10 to 15 years should easily fire up that imagination of not only the accidental bystander, so to say, but of all historical community. The Olmec were well familiar with the magnetic properties of lodestone. Scattered around the region, most of them in Guatemala, but also in Copan, Honduras, Chiapas, Mexico, and a site in El Salvador, a certain type of statue was recovered, some big, weighing up to 50 tons, and some rather small. One example was found 80 kilometers away from its quarry. 
they are made between 2000 and 500 BC. Being very typical in shape, they generally they are generally generally called pot bellies or fat boys. The latter a misnomer since the oldest found examples exhibit the features of big females giving birth. She probably represents the supreme mother goddess. The curious thing about these statues carved out of the boulders is that a large amount of them contains a lodestone. Research now shows that the part where this lodestone is located almost always matches the navel of the ra or the, ram the right template. Meaning these artisans knew exactly how to locate the magnetized portion inside the bigger boulder and they probably used a proper lodestone to do so. Curious how only one small part of a porphyric boulder is magnetized. Lodestones are supposedly zapped by lightning, uh, beginning uh, being on the surface, remember? Maybe the entire boulders were zapped and only the part of the rock that has a certain concentration of magnetite ex exhibits the permanent magnetic attraction so typical of a lodestone. I don't know. On a side note here, uh, these black and white pictures come from a Cambridge publication, but I can't afford the access. I would have wanted to see what they have to say about this potbelly figure here uh, wearing the mushroom hat. Or of this particular piece found in 1975 in Izapa, Mexico, that is shaped like the head of a turtle or frog. It has two opposite poles, poles both directed at the front and back. The fact that the poles are exactly opposite implies that the artisan who made it was aware of the bipolarity of the stone. A third magnetized spot was located under one of the eyes. Research showed that no magnetic bar was inserted in any of the magnetized pot belly statues. But apart from the potbelly mystery and talking about magnetic bars, there is another item that, in search for ancient compasses, may be of more value. Like that last statue, also found in Zappa in 1969, if I'm not mistaken, is this 3.5 cm long polished bar, consisting of almost pure magnetized hematite. It is dated between 1400 and 1000 BC. The magnetic moment runs almost parallel with its longer dimension, seemingly indicated by a polished groove. The most interesting proposals came from the one who discovered the bar, Michael Coe, a Yale University Emeritus Professor of Archaeology. Um, or was that anthropology? Anyway experiments in which he put the bar on a piece of cork and let it float on a bowl of water showed that the groove aligned itself slightly west of magnetic north and that is the exact same direction as the entrances of so many of the Olmec buildings. The Olmec themselves might have used liquid mercury instead of a cork to set the bar afloat. This connection to the alignment of their temples, etc., could indicate that they used a similar ritual like the Chinese using Feng Shui architecture. Much more can be said, especially on the last bit, but since that this is what the official sources give us in a nutshell, then it is all easily found on YouTube. Uh, also, Michael J. Cohen's lectures are on YouTube. Um, I advise you go and look for that yourself. I am going to call it a day for this one. The next part will be on stony fish and fishy stones. Moving back westwards, I will try myself to give a slightly different timeline of the history of the compass. So, more to come. Stay tuned. And as always, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. The Chinese were familiar with it. The Chinese also knew also knew of another effect. The lodestone uh, was known because it picked up small pieces of iron, but the Chinese knew also that if you floated a lodestone so it could turn freely, 
they generally floated it on a little saucer in water, it always pointed north and south. We say the compass points north. The Chinese, being Chinese, I suppose, say that it points south. Actually, of course, it points north and south.